uh, Philippians, the second chapter, and we're going to turn to the fifth verse. Second chapter and the fifth verse. Amen. And it reads, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. For, I'm sorry. Your own attitude of that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point even of death on the cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you bless this word, touch it that it enters the minds and hearts of your people, that it make them conform to be more and more like your son. We thank you and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. If I want to give you a title, the series that we'll be in over the next four weeks is The Gift. So that's why you're seeing The Gift. But for this message, the title will be A Case for Christmas. A Case for Christmas. Uh, I know as I posted some things and I said, let you guys know that we're going to do The Gift, I could feel in my spirit that people were grumbling a little bit. Like, what is going on with the church in Christmas? Because, like, there's a lot of problems with Christmas. Let's be real. There's a lot. There's a lot of things wrong with Christmas. Let's just start, okay? It's kind of weird. You know, we got this whole Santa Claus guy. It's a bit strange, right? He, he comes down your chimney. That's breaking and entering. That'll give you like five to ten, right? He, 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 or he'll come through your window or something like that if you ain't got a chimney. That's weird. Older gentlemen looking for well, you to get the cookies and milk from your kids. This is strange. You do that kind of thing, you got to register in, in, in most states. Right? Then we sing weird songs. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been naughty or nice. Like, hold on, what if we start giving him the attributes of God? Like, hold on, he knows when you're sleeping. When did he become omniscient? And then he knows when you've been bad or good. When did he get out of your prison? You know, he knows. So be good for goodness. I'm going to be good because I want to please Christ Jesus, not for goodness sake. But we put this out here, right? This is kind of, kind of then we kind of confuse the kids with that. Uh, I know some of y'all might have told them, but just be careful because with one mouth you're telling them about Santa Claus, and then you're gonna turn around and tell them that that's fake. But then you're gonna tell them about Jesus, and you wonder why they're having all kind of doubts because you lied to them. There's a lot of problems with Christmas. Uh, you know, so so we know tied to Santa Claus is the tree. I already know some of y'all like, yeah, talk about the tree pastor. Get on the tree pastor. Get on the tree. I don't know if I'm talking about the tree. We know Jeremiah 10, 1 through 5 says, uh, we'll just read it. We'll just, Hear what the Lord says to you people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of nations or be terrified by signs in heaven, though the nations are terrified by them. For their practices of the people are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest and a craftsman shapes it uh, with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nail so and nail so it will not totter like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. Their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Now listen, listen, pretty much what God through his servant Jeremiah does, it starts clowning these people Right, who are, are, are pagans, who are uh, uh, worship other gods, and, and they were cutting down these trees, and they were uh, they were fastening them up, making them stand with nails and all this kind of how we make them stand with the little. It's another story, yeah. and, and they had it up right, and then they would adorn it with silver and gold. Okay. Now, now check this out. What, what, what Jeremiah is doing is he's kind of making fun of them, saying like their gods can't really do nothing. Their know. gods really don't have no power. Don't worry about them with their little trees and nonsense. There's no power associated or tied to that. Just keep serving me. Everything's going to be okay, Israel. And don't pick up their practices. Now, as a pastor, there's a lot of things I worry about come Christmas time. But honestly, I'm really not too concerned about you guys cutting down a tree, putting it in your house, adorning it, and then begin to worship it. 
Not too worried about that being the reason. Uh, if you have a golden cap in your house, but it's holding up the top of your top of your coffee table, I'm not too concerned about it because really it's just uh, for decoration. Now, if you begin to worship that thing, I'm gonna get a little bit concerned. Uh, uh, so y'all that, that's got the Christmas tree, y'all holding hands, swaying, singing, "Oh Christmas tree, how beautiful." <laughs> I don't know what kind of worship y'all doing. You got to be careful not to mix the things of the world with the things of God. Some of y'all singing Yuletide carols by the fire. Y'all don't even know what Yule is. It's a pagan festival. Mm. You singing Yuletide carols? Ooh. Anyway, we'll, we'll, I digress. We'll move, we'll move on. But there's a problem with, with Christmas, and it's not necessarily that I think you guys are going to be worshiping Christmas trees rather than more just having them as decoration for the season. But the problem is uh, some of you guys start to worship the things we put underneath Come on. the tree. Ah, the gifts. The gifts. And we sit there and we plan and we prioritize and we got savings for what we're going to get to put under the tree. Meanwhile, folk ain't paying to pay their rent. Cars is getting repossessed. We making deals so we can get the Xbox, the, the, the PS5. We making deals and saying, well, we'll put the water bill off a couple weeks. My goodness, churches are closing doors because ain't nobody paying tithes and offering because you plan and prioritize. Ah, oh, Jesus. We start giving the things of God to the world. And in that way, we can we can stumble our, across and enter into idolatry. Idolatry is one of the, the worst things that we find in the Bible. Uh, uh, the, one of the first the first commandment is that we have no other gods before Him. That we should not give the things that don't belong to uh, that don't belong to other things to, uh, from God. Right? That's one of the worst things. Really, most of the commandments are just stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Right? Don't steal the glory that belongs to God and worship another God, right? Don't steal a man's life. That's really good. Taking stuff that don't steal another person's uh, wife. Don't steal her. Like don't steal. Don't take what don't and put uh, in a place where it don't belong. That's really what we're we're talking about with the Ten Commandments. So there, there's a lot of problems with Christmas. Uh, if we go back and we just rewind a little bit, uh, what we'll see is uh, the word Christmas. And where did it come and Where does this come from? Why should we be making a case for it as Christians? It seems to be tied to some pagan stuff. We should just throw it out. Well, if we go back to as early as the 4th century, you'll find writings in early Christendom about people celebrating the birth of Christ. Uh, they called it the Nativity Festival. The Nativity Festival, the Festival of Nativity Night or something. That's what they called it, all right? So they were celebrating uh, uh, the birth of Christ. Right around the 12th century, uh, Christian leaders in the Roman Catholic Church, which was kind of the only church at the time, said, hey, we're going to call it Christmas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you're familiar with the Roman Catholic uh, celebrations and the way they do church, what, what we we'll break down is Christmas is really a, a Middle English word that means Christ and Mass, right? right? Mm -hmm. Christ and Mass. Uh, mass meaning service. If you know about Catholicism, they'll have Sunday Mass early. Right. And so that type of thing, right? So what they're really saying is that we have a Christ service. Right. Mm. It's not really the way we think about Chris Christmas right now, is it? We don't really think about having a Christ service. We think about what we're going to do with friends and family and what's under the tree and all this. But we really don't think about serving Christ. But if we go back and put Christ back in the middle of things, my God, today, if we go back and say, you know what, this should be all about Jesus. This should be about what he did, and, and we center on that and major on Jesus and our Christmas service and our Christmas lives and how we live this thing out in the season, then we put things back in order and God will be pleased and it will actually benefit us. Uh, a lot of times we go, okay, well, well what is it? The, if, if we don't find the word Christmas anywhere in the Bible, then, then how come we celebrate it? Well, interestingly enough, we don't find the word Trinity either, but we know that the story and the, 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 the doxology, the I mean, the theology, the, everything is in there for the Trinity. We just gave it a name. So when we go to Christmas, what is Christmas really about? So that's where we get to one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, most theologians say this is this is the top-notch writing from the Apostle Paul when it comes to Jesus. That this rivals even the things that we see in Colossians. Like this right here is big, high-level Jesus talk, right? You're going to get to understand a little bit about who Jesus is. So let's get right into it because that's where we're going to make most of our work. Uh, in the fifth verse, it says, make your attitudes 
that of Christ Jesus. Uh, there's the doctrine. This is the application. This is the part we're supposed to take. Make your attitude like that of Christ Jesus. Take on the attitude of Christ. I got any Christians with attitudes? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Any Christians with attitudes like, you know, like, I'm saved, but talk to you. I know I'm talking to somebody out here. You're a Christian with a little attitude. Like, I'm listening. She's like, listen. Try me if you want to. You try Christ. <laughs> but we should be taking on the attitude of Christ Jesus. Yes. My God today. So what is that attitude that we should be taking on? So it says this. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality as something to be used for his own advantage. And that word form in the Greek is morphe, right? Uh, there's another word in the Greek that is uh, skyma, which is actually a little bit different, but right here they use morphe. Skyma would mean like uh, it's my existence, like uh, I'm, I'm right now 36 years old, and in another four years, right, I'll be 40, okay? So I changed. It's, a, it's still something that's always going to be there. I'm always going to have an age, but my age changes. Morphe is saying something that is absolutely consistent. Like, I'm a human being. That's going to be consistent, right? I have a soul. That will be eternal. That's a consistent thing. The word in the Greek used here for Jesus' form is morphe, something that is consistent. He was consistently like God. Yeah. Right? right? He's consistently like God in that form, right? So it, it says, uh, who existing in the form, constantly in the form of God, did not consider equality. Everybody's fighting for equality right now, right? Like we got equality t-shirts. Everybody wants everything to be equal. Everybody wants everybody to have that. Listen, listen. Jesus did not consider equality something to hold on to. Uh-oh. That's like completely different. That's crazy talk right now, right? But we are to adopt this attitude that is in Christ Jesus that we should not be trying to hold on. Oh, I deserve this. I deserve that. What did Christ deserve but gave up? So listen, listen to the picture that we have here. We have God. Eternal. In the beginning was the word. Right? The word was with God. Jesus was with God. In the beginning, the word was God. He also was God. He was there from the beginning with God the Father equal. This is for my people who struggle with the Trinity and say, well, Jesus was the son. He was under. No, no, no. The scripture says he was equal with God in a form like God. Sitting up there with the cherub, cherubim and the seraphim was praising him and worshiping him and holy and holy and holy enthroned in the most beautiful throne. Imagine the angels singing constantly his praises. He's sitting there in the form of God and did not find that equality with God as something to hold on to. That's huge, high level, big time service and sacrificial love that's sitting there. He looked down low and said, oh my goodness. They need me. Right. Right. See, love, when you go up, is one thing. Right? If like somebody, like, like your, a friend bringing somebody they're dating, you're like, hey, bro, you did good. You did leveled up. I don't know how you did that, but oh my God. I'm like, love across an equal platform. I can see how you guys compliment each other. And if you guys work together, you could be like a power couple. This is good right here. I like this. But love when it reaches down. Love when it goes low ball. And love when it goes and says, you really can't bring me anything, but I still see something in you that I can find worth redeeming that I'm going to give myself. I'm trying to take my time, but I'm getting excited. See, see. He said, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Right. He was in a position of advantage. Right. How often are we in a position of advantage? We're winning and we want to hold on to that advantage with all we got. Yeah. Right. Like I'm the boss at work. I ain't going to get that up and let you have my spot. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to hold on to the advantage with all I got. 
We talk about these sports. We play the sports. You get there. Maybe Jonah got to listen. You keep wearing him out. Don't let him up. Jesus, having the advantage, did not consider it as something that he should hold on to. Wow. Mm. Instead, he emptied himself. Wow. Or your translation might say he poured himself. Mm. Mm. Now this is where I'm going to make my big cakes for Christmas. Here, in this right here, this, this passage of scripture right here, Jesus emptying himself, Jesus pouring himself into men. This is a God who created the sun. This is a God who spins earth on his fingertips. This is a God who has all power in his hands. This is a God who has the hair on your head numbered. This is a God who has all knowledge that ever was and ever will be. This is a God who sees everything from the beginning to the end. This God, sitting high in all his majesty, in all his power, in all his splendor, poured himself. This God poured himself into flesh. If you were to look at the cosmos and the galaxy, the earth looks literally like a speck yeah. on a giant sheet of paper. Right. Yeah. It looks like somebody took a big piece of construction paper and dotted their pencil. Right. Right. The one who created all of that Poured himself into a man. It's the greatest miracle that we can ever imagine. And it's the most sacrificial act. It's the most humble act. It, listen, listen, listen. It said, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave. What is the doctrine of Christmas? What do we learn from Christmas? That God sitting high, looked low and poured himself into the form of a man like a slave. Often we get it twisted. We think it's just about sweet baby Jesus. We think that the, the Christmas story is about a baby being born in a manger. We think about uh, 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 Mary and we think about the no room at the end and we think about the, the wise men and the shepherd's men and the, and the star in the north and, and, and all the plans to try to kill the baby. We think that's the story. No, the story in heaven. See, when he was born, there was no room for him. When he was born, it was in a manger. When he, when he was born, it was in humble beginnings. But great things was already happening in heaven. I want to talk to somebody who it seems like you're starting with really, really small beginnings. It seems like what's happening in your life is, is very minuscule and nobody's really watching. It seems like it's unimportant or all it's little or there's no room for you. But let me tell you, there's powerful things happening in heaven. And that what's inside of you that's about to be born is allowed to be born because him sitting high, look low, and poured himself into you. Oh, Jesus, we're about to get into it. Who existing in the form of a man considered equality with God as something to hold on to, but you did not use it for his advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave and taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man, in his external form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death. Now, what I want you to understand here is when he poured himself, he didn't lose any of his divine nature. Glory. I want you to catch this. When he poured himself, he didn't lose any of his divine nature. We see in Colossians 2 9, for the entire fullness of the Godhead, the uh, I'm sorry, the entire fullness of the deity dwells in the bodily form of Christ. 
So when he poured himself, he did not lose any of his godlike attributes. But he did humble himself, no longer doing his will, but the will of the Father. So he gave up kingship. He gave it up so that he can take it on again in an even greater fashion because the sacrifice needed for sin. The sacrifice needed for sin meant that a king had to die so a kingdom could be raised. What we're seeing here is an act of love. What we're seeing here is a triumphant, perfect being doing the most selfless act imaginable. And so how does that, uh, uh, how does that affect us? In the same way that God poured himself into man, God now is able to pour himself into you by the power of his Holy Spirit. That he's able to pour himself into you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, uh. So, what was it in the empty? We are to take, to take on the same mindset, the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. The same way he emptied himself we ought to empty ourselves. The same way he denied himself and all that he had and he deserved, we don't deserve any of it, but we should take on that mindset of denying ourselves. Let me tell you, the best form of self-help is self-denial. Oh, somebody don't want to hear that. But the best form of self-help is denying my flesh so that Christ can pour himself into me, that the Holy Spirit pour himself into me. I want to talk to somebody who's having a tough time with Christmas, and, and this is your first Christmas as a divorcee, uh, Jesus, and you're feeling lonely, but I want to tell you that he's still poor. Uh, I want to talk to somebody who this is your first Christmas as a divorcee, and you ain't got the kids this year, and the house seems a little bit lonely, and Christmas doesn't seem the same, and you don't think that you have a reason to celebrate, but he's still poor himself, oh my God, today. I, I want to talk to somebody who doesn't have all that much money, and you feel like, I don't have, I can't buy all the gifts that I want for my kids, and, and when they open up the, the, the presents on Christmas morning, it might feel like it's a little bit empty, but I want to tell you that he's still poor himself. I want to talk to somebody who's feeling like they have holiday depression and you lost somebody along the way. And then Christmas don't feel the same because, because uh, you don't have your loved one with you and, and you're feeling lonely. But I want to tell you that he still poured himself into flesh. And the fact that he poured himself into flesh and the fact that the Holy Spirit is poured into you, you still have a reason to celebrate you still have a reason to make much and say, you know what? I'm going to have Christ mass. I'm going to have Christ service. I want to serve my Lord and Savior. And how did Christ serve people? He didn't come that he would be served. He came to serve, to give his life a ransom, to pay the price and the penalty we could not pray. So I need to start serving somebody else. I need to stop looking at me and what I'm missing. I need to deny myself and start to serve other people in the name of Christ Jesus. Because if he be lifted up, Let's look through the 
the, 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 the mind, the eyes of Ezekiel. Let's look through the eyes of Isaiah. And let's imagine seeing the cherubim and the seraphim up there worshiping and praising. And Jesus sitting on the most glorious throne Hallelujah. that you could possibly imagine. Imagine him with complete equal footing as God the Father. Imagine all that glory. Imagine all that beauty. And he said, I'll give it up. So they can beat me all night long. I'll give it up. So they can spit in my face. I'll give it up. So they can beat me and say, prophesy who was it that hit you. I'll give it up. So they can whoop me all night long. I'll give it up. So they can beat me so bad people were wondering, why isn't this man dead? Then I'll carry a cross, my God, today. I'll carry it to a place called Golgotha. I'll carry it to a place that was made for death. And I won't think about what I gave up. I won't think about how Jesus. I won't think about all that I had everything, all I had rights to. Or the claim, the throne I had claimed for. The throne that was rightly mine. The fact that I was in the position of which I deserve. But I'm going to go and do this for these undeserving people. That why they're yet sinners, I love them. That why they're in their oh, translation, yeah. precious. I'm going to die for them. That why they're not thinking about me, I'm going to step down from heaven. Wreck myself in flesh and pull. See, the pouring didn't stop when he did it into the flesh. In his word, he pours into us, my God, today. Each day, he's pouring into you. That's why we have to die daily to make room for what God is doing. Make room for more of his spirit. Make room for his word in our mind. That we have the same mind in us that's also in Christ Jesus. He said, I'll go and I'll let them put nails in my hands and nails in my feet. Because the scars that you may be feeling this Christmas, the scars of lost loved ones, the scars of failed relationships, the scars of feeling like you're disappointing somebody, the scars that Chris, the Christmas brings to mind and to heart will one day be all washed away because the only scars in heaven, the only scars in heaven are on the hands and feet of our Savior. And everything that you're dealing with right now, every pain that you feel, every hurt that you feel will all be washed away because he poured. For this reason, God, mm, this is why we celebrate Christmas. This is why we should do it the right way. Not about the gifts, the toys, and all the other nonsense. But this is why we should celebrate that Jesus came. It's because God said, for this reason. The word of God says, for this reason. Because he poured. Because he sacrificed. Because he was humble. Because he emptied himself. Because he assumed the position of a slave. Because he took on the likeness of men. Because of that. God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So because there was sweet baby Jesus in a manger, you have the power to, to, to talk against anything that has a different name than Jesus. Because there was sweet baby Jesus, I born in no place, there's no room for him, but he still came and was born with the hay and in the trough. Because of that sweet baby Jesus, you can call out Jesus when they say you got cancer. You can call out Jesus' name when they say that you ain't gonna make it. And you can call out Jesus' name when they, can, when they say you were a failure. You can call out Jesus' name. The name that is above every other name because he came. Because there's a Christmas story by God today. See, this ain't just about somebody wanting a little rifle that might shoot their eye out. This ain't just about uh, uh, the, the fancy movies in the Hallmark where they always end up taking a, 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 a nice guy over the business city guy. It ain't about all of that. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And that he, because he came, was given a name that's above every name, and you were given access by faith to that name. Does it mean everything's going to be perfect? No. 
doesn't mean you won't feel pain, that you won't go through hard times. No. Doesn't mean that you're going to, every prayer that you want is going to be answered the way you want it to be answered. Absolutely not. But what it does mean is that he promised you a few things. He promised you that where he, he went, that he's going to make a place for you, and there you will be also. He promises you that the, the, the afflictions of this world will pale in comparison to when we get on to glory. What he promises you is justification. What he promises you is sanctification. What he promises you is salvation. And what he promises you is ultimately glorification, new bodies, and be with him for eternity. That's a reason to The name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I want you y'all to understand this. It's going to bow. Look to your neighbor and say, it's going to bow. I, I, I don't know what your it is. I, I don't know who your it is. But it's going to bow. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what they said about you. I don't know what they tried to put on you, but it's going to bow. I don't know how many people that told you, stop talking that Jesus talk, stop walking that Jesus walk, but it's going to bow. I don't care what they have applied against you or what they're saying. All of it has to bow at the name of Jesus. There will come a day, my God, today. There will come a day where everybody in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, every principality, every evil thing, every weapon for But he's 
stepped down and poured himself into flesh. Still being God, still having all power, but submitting that power to serve like a slave. To be questioned of men when you know all things. To be doubted of men when you've never failed. To be questioned when you never, there was never something you never, you didn't know. This is what he subjected himself to. And he did it. I got to that. He did it with you on his mind. Yeah. Titus 3, 4 and 7 says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing and rebirth of his Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, mm. Mm. Wow. become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's why we deny self. Because he's pouring. He's pouring. And if there be anyone who says, you know what? He's willing to pour into me. He was willing to pour out for me. I want to accept that love that he's extending by the power of his Holy Spirit. I want to accept that into my heart, my mind, and my life. I want him to be Savior and Lord. A lot of times we want him to be Savior. We just want him to save us, but we don't want to let him be Lord. We don't want to give him ownership. We don't want him to give him the keys. Just pull me out. I don't want to have to listen. No, we want him to be Lord and Savior. It's a two-part deal. It's a two-part deal. So if you want to make that deal, say, look, look. I just want to give my life to Jesus. This will be your time to stand. If there's someone who just wants to, you know what, I've been in a backslidden state. I just want to rededicate my life to him. This will be your time to stand. And then for everyone else, we're standing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you for the poor. We thank you that you sitting high saw us down here low and that you came. You came to rescue. You came to pay a ransom, Lord. We ask that this word be in the hearts and minds of your people, heavy, that we be thankful in this season, that we celebrate Christmas, that we serve you in a true Christ madness. We just thank you for your goodness and your kindness. In Jesus' name.